Well, hi, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here with Justin. He's the host, but he's letting me start this one off. And I didn't tell him I'm going to do this, but I got a little kind of surprise uh, hermeneutic exercise for you. Uh oh. Okay. Uh, I'm reading from Oral Roberts' book uh, from the 50s entitled If You Need Healing, Do These Things. Justin, go ahead and uh, help us with this one. Uh, Oral starts out in a chapter on the steps to your deliverance saying, Jesus Christ did not come with a life-shortening suggestion, but with life-saving power. His highest wish is for us to prosper materially and have physical health equal to his peace and power in our soul. He said, being Jesus, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prosperous. Jesus said that, uh, Oral Roberts says in 3 John 1-2, uh, and the story of Jesus is the story of deliverance. What's the problem with, uh, with an interpretation like that and a statement like that from a, 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 a giant of the healing movement like Oral Roberts? Right. Well, there, there's several. I'm always somewhat amused when I hear that verse referred to as 3 John 1, 2 because there's, there's only one chapter in 3 John, so it's really just 3 John 2. But that is one of the, that is one of the um, go-to verses for the prosperity Gospel and Oral Roberts is one, the one who really made it famous in the sense of taking it out of context. But John was writing a letter to his friend Gaius, uh, and you would see Gaius's name in the first verse of that short little book of Third John. And, Guy, and John opens his letter in much the same way that you and I would open a letter or an email that we write to one of our friends. Basically, John was saying. Dear Gaius, I hope that this finds you doing well. Mm. This is not a doctrinal statement. It's not a blanket promise for guaranteed money and guaranteed healing. Uh, that's not at all what it is. This was a common greeting to a letter. It remains a common greeting in letters that we write uh, today in just a little bit different form. So it's not, a, it's not a blanket promise for guaranteed money and healing. And one of the fundamental principles of hermeneutics, sound hermeneutics, is you look at who is writing it? To whom is it being written? What's, what is he saying? It has to have made sense to the original recipients. Whatever interpretation you come up with, if it, does, if it would not have made sense to the original recipient, then you've got the wrong meaning. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to look at all of those things. And, so, um, and also we let Scripture interpret Scripture. So he's patently, he's got the gospel wrong for one thing when he says that the highest desire of Jesus is for us to be materially wealthy mm -hmm. and healed. That is not. Uh, uh, God's, God's will for us is to be saved, is to be sanctified, is to be suffering for the gospel, uh, and to be sexually pure. Mm -hmm. So that, that is the will of God for our lives, not to... And plus, I, I'm often amazed, I mean, what is it in the lives of the apostles that we read in the book of Acts that makes us think that we are promised money and healing. Silver and gold have I none. What do you do with that? Uh, and you look at the apostles, read 2 Corinthians 11, 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 28, and you see this long list of hardships that Paul was going through, was shipwrecked, was stoned, was imprisoned. He had dangers from countrymen, dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers. Uh, uh, and he said, on top of all this, had the daily burden of the churches. I mean, wh what about that sounds like prosperity? Yeah. Having your best life now, not at all. And Peter was crucified upside down. Stephen was stoned. So anyway, he's, he's got an awful lot of scripture he's got to explain away. Yeah. And taking 3 John 2 out of context is not the way to do it. Well, speaking of getting things right, let's talk a little bit about cessation and the position. We've talked a bit already about that it is a negative term already. It's an unfortunate term to be right. in the negative tense. But um, some of the questions, you know, I've written down people ask or the statements they make about cessation, you know, is, well, as cessationists, we don't believe that God heals. And as a cessationist, Justin, you know, you don't believe in the Holy Spirit or you're <laughs> putting the Holy Spirit in a box right. uh, that you don't have the Spirit. And another one would be that you're preaching a partial gospel. I've heard people call cessation heresy. Yeah, I've yeah. heard people say that you're outside evangelical borders and orthodoxy if you say that you're a cessationist. And I've heard people call it, you know, telling God what he is and what he is not. 
and reading things into the text, what are some of the ways that you would explain cessationism, first of all, uh, maybe even using different terms, but overall to explain that we do affirm certain things and then also that maybe, maybe there's a bad stigma around it and yeah. people might have it wrong. There is, there is, Costi. Of course, as you said, the, the word itself has a negative ring to it, so you're kind of beginning behind the eight ball, so to speak. But cessationism is not the belief that God is no longer doing miracles today. If we were going to say that, we'd have to say God is no longer saving people today mm -hmm. because the greatest miracle is not when someone gets out of a wheelchair or someone's healed of cancer or whatever. The greatest miracle is the new birth. So it's, it's just nonsensical to say, oh, cessationists don't believe that God is doing miracles today. Absolutely patently untrue. Uh, nor is cessationism the belief that God is no longer uh, giving spiritual gifts, or you believe that uh, you don't believe in the spiritual gifts. Well, yes, I do. That's another accusation. Absolutely. That's another accusation. You don't believe in the gifts. Well, I do believe in the gifts. Uh, I just no longer believe, or I don't believe that the apostolic gifts are still in operation today. The gifts of tongues, interpretation of tongues, and those are two separate gifts, by mm -hmm. the way. A lot of people don't realize that, but mm -hmm. two separate gifts tongues, interpretation of tongues, the gift of miracles, and the gift of physical healing that those gifts are still operative in the church today. But all the other more normative gifts, the service gifts, teaching, administration, exhortation, uh, giving, hospitality, I very much affirm that all of these gifts are operative in the church today. And one of the points that I would make, Costi, and I know you share this conviction, share this belief, if all of the spiritual gifts, including the apostolic gifts, are still in operation in the church today, then where is the guy with the gift of healing? Where's that guy? Now, when God gives us spiritual gifts, He gives those gifts for the purpose of edifying the church, building up the body, edifying the church. If you have the gift of teaching, you're to be using that gift regularly in the church. Mm -hmm. If you have the gift of administration, you're to be using that gift regularly in the church. Gift of exhortation, gift of mercy, you're to be using these gifts regularly. Where's the person with the gift of healing? Where's that guy? Where? where? Well, they would argue, right? If potentially, I don't, my uncle, or even just not to pick on Uncle Benny, but a Bill Johnson or a Bethel Church. Yep. They're going to argue. You know, Todd White is going to say, you know, here I am, Justin. Look <laughs> at what I'm doing. Look yeah. at what's happening. So you're wrong. I'm right. Brother, you should come to one of our services. I mean, you've been to Todd Bentley's service as well. Yep. Uh, that's on YouTube. <laughs> what, what would you say to that then if they're saying, well, here I am. I'm, I'm doing this. Yeah. Well, they're not because what they're claiming is the gift of healing bears absolutely no resemblance to what we see in the New Testament. Whether it's your uncle, whether it's Todd White or somebody like this, they go up to people either at a crusade in the case of your uncle or with Todd White walking up to people randomly on the streets and supposedly healing people. Well, all of these healings are psychosomatic, mind over body. Uh, there is a documentary entitled Miracles for Sale and it's mm -hmm. fast. I don't know if you saw it. I've seen it. Did you see it? Yeah, I did. And they trained this guy who's yep. not a Christian, doesn't claim to be a Christian, spent what was about six weeks with this guy training him in the evangelical faith healing lingo. And how to do hypnosis. How to do hypnosis, right. Yep. And uh, so after some training, they followed him on the streets of Dallas, Texas, and he went up to people completely at random. You remember that? He heals, he does the... Yeah, does the leg lengthening, exact, just like Todd White does. You know, heals one or lengthens one leg about, makes it grow about that much or supposedly. And he had the exact same results, the exact same results that Todd White does. Yeah. And this man was not a believer. Not a believer. Had been training to do this. Right. And was, was knowingly and actively faking it. That's right. Now, aside from probably the, the absurd objection, which maybe some, some third waivers would say, well, even in that man's attempt to fake it, you know, the Holy Spirit was using him to kind of put those, you know, that yeah. would be absurd. Right. In a, in a, you know, aside from that, what are the things that, you know, that he does? I mean, from hypnosis, w talk about the power of suggestion as well. Oh, What's, yes. you, how they move really fast and go, you're going to feel this, you're going to do this. What, what are they doing there? Yeah. It, it is absolutely the power of suggestion and hypnosis. 
they, uh, they, they talk to people and they, they tell people what to expect. Hmm. Uh, okay, now you're feeling this. They, they su suggest these things to people. And when you're, when you're predisposed to this, uh, and, and, and you're not thinking critically, you're, you're just kind of predisposed to this, and you think this person is operating from some position of authority or expertise, uh, you're, you're going to go along with it. It's the power of suggestion. Oh, you're feeling, you know, I've got my hand on your ankle. You're feeling warmth, aren't you? Do you feel that? Do you feel mm -hmm. that? And like, they're like, yeah. You think people feel pressure to say, well, yeah, oh, okay, and they, and they even want it. Some of them are innocently on the street thinking, yes. wow, is this my lucky day? Right. And they want it, right? So they're like, "Yeah, okay, I, I think so." Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah, mm. yeah. And he had the exact same results that Todd White does. Now, what you won't see, and I know you would affirm this from your years in uh, working for your uncle, what yeah. you will not see is somebody that looks like me stand up and start running around. Cerebral palsy. Yeah. Throw the crutches. Yeah. See you later. Right. Exactly. If Todd White can command someone's leg to grow about half an inch, then theoretically he should be able to command an amputee to grow a new limb. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't he do that? Yeah. There's no videos of that. Yeah. There's no videos of an amputee growing a new limb. Yeah. There's no videos of a Down syndrome child yeah. being restored. Yeah. Why not? If you can command a leg to grow, then command a Down syndrome child to be restored. Which they've called sickness and disease, by the way, many times, which um, I spent some time working, it was a few years volunteering with a special needs organization, best volunteer years of my life. And the very first few weeks there, I learned a lot. Mm. And I got my worldview flipped upside down on, on what special needs ministry really is. And one of the things oh. that was devastating to these parents and to these people is the idea that, you know, whether it's an extra chromosome or whatever people view it as or whatever, is that they're sickly and they're diseased and they actually need to be healed and fixed of it as well. Right. Oftentimes that was devastating to parents. And, and, right. and, you're, and, and you're right. There is no, where's the healing ministry that suddenly solves, right, this issue right. that is perceived to be sickness and disease, that they've actually called it that. Right. And now you're causing people simply to, to live in question as if yeah. God loves them less because right. their child has Down syndrome. That's right. Uh, it's probably one of the more low points of these false claims is to put that on people. Kasi, I, I cannot tell you how many people I've talked to, many of them at, at Benny Hinn Crusades, uh, uh, how many emails I've received, how many people I've talked to in person out preaching who have been through this and uh, they have been made to believe that the reason they're sick or the reason their child is sick yeah. or handicapped or whatever is because they don't have enough faith. Yeah. They lack faith. Uh, they've got, there's something wrong with them. And, and what's especially heartbreaking is when you see parents with, with very, very small children. And I've talked to many of these parents at Benny Hinn Crusades. Uh, have very, very small children, young, young children who are not even old enough to even know anything about God. I mean, they, we're talking infants, toddlers. Yeah. And so it can't be the toddler's fault. I mean, he doesn't even know his right hand from his left, as the Bible says. But so the responsibility falls to the parent. And the parent thinks, my child is sick because I don't have enough faith yeah. for him. My faith for him is not strong enough. Yeah. My child is sick because of me. Mm -hmm. My lack of faith, wow. my sin, my lack of giving. Uh, and, and that is just, that is uh, some of the more egregious um, uh, harms and hurts and, and damages that you see from, yeah. from a physical standpoint, um, that you see that the prosperity gospel yeah. wreaks upon people. So what, what is going to be a, a cessationist or a non-normative you know, person who views those gifts as non-normative today? What does that person you know, view healing as? Or what does that person even view the work of the Spirit as? What are some of the correct views? If a cessationist says, oh, we believe in the work of the Spirit and we believe in healing, what does that look like? Um, so we're not being painted or painting even 
the cessationist position as this position just based on fear. You want to quench the spirit. You know, you're, you have cerebral palsy and it didn't get healed, so that's why you're a cessationist. All the, all the absurdity and just the, the kind of pontifications of people. What is a, a cessationist that is a biblical worldview and at, at least a, some fidelity to the text view healing as and the work of the Spirit as? I do believe that God heals, but only when it is His sovereign will to do so. And it is, it is much more the exception than it is the rule. It is, not, it is not always God's will for a person to be healed. It's not even most of the time God's will for a person to be healed. I, I do believe that it is a, a, a relatively rare, or we could just say a rare thing, when God dramatically, instantaneously heals someone. But when He does it, it will be obvious to, to everyone. There'll be no question about who wrought it. Mm -hmm. No gradual over time, you know, kind of thing. When God, God heals in a dramatic way, it will be instant and verifiable. Uh, I am not against, as a cessationist, I am not against people praying for healing, either for themselves or for a loved one. I'm not against that. Yeah. I do that myself yeah. uh, for people. But I also know that sometimes there is something far better than being physically healed. And that is knowing God's sufficient grace, knowing His strength made perfect in our weakness. And Kasi, this is gonna kinda get into another whole um, theological realm here, but I think it would behoove all of us. We've got, to, we've got to settle it in our minds. We've got to have a proper view of the holiness of God and the depravity of man. Mm -hmm. And my pastor, Jim Osmond, said this to me one time and it really stuck with me. And, and I know this to be true. We underestimate how sinful we really are. Mm -hmm. If God were to strike from me everything that I have, if He were to take away my wife, Kathy, if He were to take away my health, everything that I own, and leave me cold in a ditch to die alone, a slow and painful death somewhere, and then send me to hell. He would have done me no wrong. You deserve that. That's what I deserve. He would have done me no wrong. He would have done you no wrong yeah. in doing that. And, and so anything short of hell for us, that is, that is the mercy and the grace of God. So God doesn't owe us anything. We have this, wow. we have this mindset that God somehow owes us because of preachers like, um, Joel Osteen, we're supposed to have our best life now. Mm. God doesn't owe us anything. We owe Him everything. Wow. And so um, even, even in sickness and disease and trials and persecution, there is, there is an inherent mercy even in that. And, and there, is, there is a privilege even in that to, to just be able to have the assurance through the merits of Christ on the cross that though this life is short and full of trouble, as Job says, uh, we have all of eternity to live without cerebral palsy, to live without cancer, to live without arthritis. We have all of eternity. And so, yes, trials are hard uh, this side of, of life. They, they are, they're hard. The trials are not to be enjoyed. The Bible doesn't say enjoy your trials. The Bible says, count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Yeah. Not if, but when. Yeah. And so it's, it's not that we enjoy, I don't enjoy cerebral palsy. I don't. And um, years and years ago, I used to tell people that I was, um, you know, it's, it, cerebral palsy is one of the greatest gifts that God has ever given me. I wish I could scrub, you know, all the video <laughs> of, of me saying that. and, and, uh, and because I don't teach that anymore. It, it, cerebral palsy is not a gift. It's a trial. Mm -hmm. And there's some days I wake up and, you know, I just don't really feel like being crippled that day and I wish I wasn't. Uh, so it's not that we enjoy these things, but we rest in the goodness of God. We rest mm -hmm. in His sovereignty and we rest knowing that whatever happens to us in this life uh, is is far, far better than anything that we deserve. Mm -hmm. And so there is a special uh, mercy and grace even in our suffering. And, and sometimes God is most glorified in us through our suffering, yeah. 
through our persecution and in the midst of suffering, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of these trials, we remain faithful to Christ and we serve Him anyway. And we, we speak well of Him and we point other people to Him. That, it is in those times that God is most glorified in us. Not, not when we, we have everything that we want. So I mean. you said, so two things I think I'd love for you to speak into. One, you said God is, God's goodness still is prevalent even in your condition. So first answer why, and biblically, why is God still good if you're still crippled? I mean, that, mm -hmm. how is he still good? For people that are suffering with cancer and have lost children, why? Because, and of course, there are people that falsely claim that other things, like, you know, Bill Johnson's recent book, God is good or whatever it is. It's about God's, basically God's always in a good mood, but that goodness means that you get all the things you want. How biblically speaking, is God still good if you're, if you don't, if you're not getting all the things that you want? Right. It's, uh, well, it comes back to we have to have a proper view of our own sinfulness and realize that God doesn't owe us anything. And so you're tying it back to depravity. And I am, sin. yeah. Wow. Because we don't, we don't deserve anything. I don't deserve to be able to sit here at this desk in relatively good health as far as I know and, and uh, be able to, to move around and drive a truck and all that. I don't, I don't deserve any of this. I, I don't. So God is merciful to us in, in everything, even through these trials and, and sickness and, and all of these uh, uh, persecutions. He's, there's a goodness and there's a mercy in God in, in allowing us to suffer. Wow. It, it's an honor. It's an honor to be allowed to suffer yeah. for the cause of Christ. Yeah, Paul said you've been granted, literally granted, given the privilege exactly. of suffering, exactly. sharing in the sufferings of Christ. Yeah, we have been granted the privilege to, to wow. suffer for the Lord's sake. That's a privilege. Now, that doesn't fly with the prosperity preachers. No. That, that is anathema to them. They don't even have a concept of that. But that is, that is sound doctrine. So that, God's and, nature, His goodness, his mercy operates outside of our experience and whatever yes. we're going through. So our circumstances don't dictate God's goodness. Right. God is simply good. He is simply good. And, you know, I, I tell people, if, if you have not done a study on the attributes of God, do yourself a favor and study the attributes of God. Because when we understand who God is, and when we understand His providence, mm. when we understand His sovereignty, when we understand His... Uh, to use the term aseity, when we understand mm -hmm. His goodness and His mercy and all of these attributes of God, uh, His love, uh, His wrath, yeah. when we understand His wrath, when we understand who God really is, not the, not the caricatured Joel Osteen God, yeah. the biblical God, yeah. when we understand who He is, we rest in that. We, re and we, can, we know that God not only will not act towards us in any way that is contrary to his nature, yeah. he can't. Wow. He can't because he would be denying himself. In, in the last uh, five minutes or whatever we have here, will you do, I'm sure you will, but one of the best things you could possibly do for people watching is as a cessationist who understands the biblical boundaries surrounding the topic of healing and miracles and all that, based on the Word of God. Describe the work of the Holy Spirit. For a person that says, ah, you, you quench him, you grieve him, mm -hmm. you blaspheme him, you put him in a box and toss it out. Justin Peters, you don't believe in the Holy Spirit and his work. Give people the, the biblical truth about the work of the Spirit, that we are Spirit-filled, Bible-believing men who love and revere yes. the Holy Spirit as a person. Kind of take us there to to yes. tie this off. For the one who is outside of Christ, the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment, convicts them of the truth of the gospel, and then He saves them. He regenerates them. He, he sanctifies us. He seals us for the day of redemption. Our, our salvation is completely secure mm -hmm. in the present active working of the Holy Spirit of God. And for the believer, the greatest, one of the greatest works of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life is this, Costi, is that He illumines the meaning of this book. He cultivates in us a desire to read and study God's Word because it is here where we, we know God, know who He is. He gives us that desire. 
He illumines the meaning of God's Word to our hearts and to our minds. He brings it alive to us, brings God's Word alive to us, creates in us this desire to know Him, helps us to understand the Word of God and to appropriate it. And He conforms us through reading and studying. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Read, study, and obey God's Word. He empowers us to obey it. He gives us uh, the, the ability to resist temptation. Mm -hmm. He gives us the ability to endure persecution, conforms us into the image of Christ, and that is the real working of the Holy Spirit of God, conforming us into the image of Christ. And in Romans 1, 28 through 32, there's a, a very sobering, that's a very sobering passage of Scripture. You look at this long list of sins. Paul's talking about people who have been given over to a depraved mind. Mm -hmm. And then he talks about who those who are violent, proud, haters of God, inventors of evil things, sexually immoral, murderers. And then interestingly he says gossips, which we don't think of gossip as a serious sin, but it's right in that same list. That's convicting. It is, it is. And then, Costi, he says undiscerning, mm -hmm. undiscerning. That is a sobering passage of Scripture. Paul is not talking about backslidden Christians. Backslidden is not even a New Testament concept. He is talking about those who have been given over. He's talking about lost people. These are the sins in Romans 1, 28 through 32. These are the sins that characterize the lives of unbelievers. And one of those sins, right in the same list of, of murderers and people who hate God, sexually immoral, undiscerning. Wow. So we have a responsibility to be thinking Christians. Yes. Thinking people. Yes. Discerning people. Yeah. And that only comes, you're saying, from the work of the Holy Spirit. So if you right. have the Holy Spirit, it ain't because you talk in tongues and because you no. say you can heal. You're saying, you're tying discernment to the evidence of the residence of the Holy yeah. Spirit yes. in a person's life. Wow. Because He illumines the meaning of God's Word and a lack of discernment is a possible an indication that a person may not even be in union with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is not a weakling. Amen. If He's strong enough to save us, He's strong enough to deliver us out of deception. Yeah. And I tell people that if you have a friend or a family member who is in this movement and uh, they've been in this movement for years and years and years and there's no alarm bells going off, there's no warning signs, then something is wrong. I had a man tell me through an email, he was in his early 70s, he said that he had been saved for over 50 years, been a Christian for over 50 years. And he told me Joel Osteen is one of his favorite preachers. Mm. And I wrote him back, I said, sir, I'm concerned for you. Yeah. Because you, you can't be saved for half a century and think that Joel Osteen is a good preacher because the Holy Spirit drives us to this book, yeah. helps us to understand this book. Yeah. And when you read and study this book, over time, you're going to get discernment. Amazing. And so that's why Paul included that sin in the list of unbelievers. So it's, it's a real, you and I have talked about this before and I'll close mm -hmm. with this. One of the great ironies in all of this, Costi, is that whether it's Benny, whether it's Bill Johnson or Todd White or Kenneth Copeland or one of these others, they would look at somebody like me or you now mm -hmm. and they would say, you don't believe in the Holy Spirit. You don't believe in His power. Yeah. To the contrary, I am so confident in the power and working of God's Holy Spirit, so confident in His power to change us, sanctify us, conform us into the image of Christ that I do not believe that someone can be indwelt by the third person of the triune Godhead, the Holy Spirit of God, and teach the kinds of blasphemies and heresies that these people teach. Or can, over years and years and years, soak this kind of doctrine in and not have any alarm bells going off. Yeah. So the great irony is that it is actually the people on the other side of this debate that have a very dim view of the Holy Spirit of God, not Man. us. Man, that is hard truth, but that is the truth right there. Yeah. Um, well, we're going to talk more in the next program about sovereignty, suffering, and sanctification. I'm really excited about that, yeah. kind of a Romans 8, yeah. 28 
um, time together. So we'll talk more about that. And, and of course, you are per someone living that uh, with yeah. cerebral palsy. And we all are in many ways, but some more than others in other ways. And then also uh, in a program after that, we're going to talk about real heresy and using the H right. word in the right way. In the right way. And what yes. really is the hills we die on uh, when it comes to theology. So let me turn it over to you to close this thing out because it's just too weird me All interviewing right. you when I look All up right. to you so much. All right, brother. <laughs> well, dear friends, thank you. We, we hope this has been encouraging and edifying for you. It certainly has been for us. So until our next program, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with you all.